Good day, good day to everyone. Thanks for being here for this for this event. I'm Wojtek Kalinowski. I'm the co-director of the Veblen Institute, which is a politically independent think tank based in Paris, France. And I'm very pleased to to host, co-host, I should say, this event with our friends and partners from Positive Money Europe, Vicky van Oek is with us today. And uh, uh, Vicky will uh, moderate our session. I just uh, say very, very I just make a very short introduction, starting by uh, excusing the the team for the small delay, and we had some technical problems, some panelists have uh, technical problems with accessing to, to the panel, but I am sure they will join us in a minute. So we'll uh, just start and I in, in as a very short introduction, we have a very rich panel today. Uh, and I let Vicky to present uh, the panelists in a moment. I just uh, take a minute to explain why we organize this. Uh, event and why we are very pleased to have all those panelists with us today. Um, uh, Vicky will uh, explain uh, what Positive Money Europe uh, does on this front, but at Veblen Institute we, uh, we run a, um, a program on monetary and financial reforms and uh, last year we launched uh, a digital Euro watch, uh, uh, which is basically a network for uh, scholars and uh, experts and civil society actors to discuss this topic because we found there was a uh, this was a very important potential reform of the European monetary system but there was no real space to discuss it in a transdisciplinary way where uh, where experts and institutions and civil society could discuss these things so uh, in the beginning of this year we published the first report and uh, we have the lead author, author of that report with us as panelists today, Tristan Dissot. Uh, but the panel is, uh, and the, this round table is not about the report, although I'm sure Tristan will come back to, the, come back to it. Um, we basically wanted to uh, ask the panel uh, about their opinion on, on four main issues, uh, which are for us key issues with the, the digital euro. As you know, the European Central Bank runs an investigation phase currently, uh, uh, and uh, we don't know what this phase will lead up to, but we do know that the central uh, digital euro is not the only project of a central uh, digital currency in Europe. Uh, and in and indeed in the world, it's a main main trend trend uh, throughout the world. So uh, in any event, it's very important to discuss what uh, this product is about and what this will lead to or, or not not lead to. So we ask uh, our four or five panelists to give the opinion about four issues that we presented in the invitation. Uh, four aspects of the of of, of our issue, which uh, is uh, the inclusiveness. So, can the future digital euro guarantee universal access to digital money? The fair cost for users, and it's not only the overall cost for payment system, but also the the equity aspect of this. Um, the privacy and the resilience of the payment system. The resilience meaning. Uh, can the, the digital euro improve uh, the reliability of the payment system in case in case of extreme events? So these are the four four issues that we found very vital to to, to discuss as as the project is being prepared. Because the the main point I think of the of of our of our of the report and also of our of our message at the digital euro watch is that there is a strong link between. Uh, between uh, the technical choices, the design options, and what the future digital euro will uh, or will not be able to do. Uh, so uh, with uh, this short introduction, I leave to Vicky to present the panelists. And uh, uh, Tristan later on will present the, uh, the the typology that we sort of sketched out in, in the report about 
about uh, different different uh, design options. Uh, Vicky, if I hope that our panelists are with us, and I let you present also positive money and start the discussion. Yes, thank you, Wojciech. Hi, and welcome everyone to this policy roundtable on the Digital Euro. Our sincerest apologies for the delay. I'm very happy to see all the panelists are here well and safe. So my name is Vicky Benak. I'm the Executive Director at Positive Money Europe. I'll be your co-host and moderator for today's discussion, where we will hear from our panel of policymakers, but also civil society stakeholders on the Digital Euro project, who I will introduce in a moment. So very briefly, uh, a few words about Positive Money. We are an international non profit research and campaign organization that works towards a money and banking system that enables a fair, sustainable and democratic economy. So we've been following specifically debate on the digital euro since 2018, and we see it as our role to bring the public and society's interest to the fore of public debates on central bank digital currencies, together with other civil society uh, members, such as the Baben Institute and also Bayek, the consumer organization. So this brings us to today's topic uh, round of the roundtable. Will the digital euro make our money system better? And on that note, I would like to present the five speakers today who are very well placed to tell us at what stage of the digital euro project we are today and where it is heading or perhaps where it should be heading. So first uh, we have Evelyn Witlux. So Evelyn is the Digital Euro Program Director at the European Central Bank and the former Global Director of Payments for ING and board member of the European Payments Councils. Next, we have Jan Kaysens. So Jan is the head of the Digital Finance Unit for the Directorate General for Financial Stability, Financial Services and Capital Markets Union, quite a mouthful, at the European Commission. And this is the unit that is jointly responsible for the proposal on the Digital Euro with the DG for Economic and Financial Affairs and also DG Connect. Next, we have Paul Tang. So Paul is a member of the European Parliament for the Dutch Partij van de Arbeid as part of the group of Socialists and Democrats. He is also a member of the Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs, and his priorities include the fight against tax evasion, digital taxation, sustainable finance, platform regulation, and of course, the digital euro. Next, we have Anna Martin. Anna is the Financial Services Officer at the European Consumer Organization, BEOC. She is also a member of the Rulebook Development Group. And as the name implies, this is a group that is developing a rulebook for a digital euro scheme based on the ECB's governing council's decisions on the design of the digital euro. And last but not least, we have Tristan Dissot. Tristan is a researcher at the Université Libre de Bruxelles and is the coordinator of the Digital Euro Watch at Veblen Institute and co-author of Veblen Institute's most recent report on the Digital Euro. Just to give you a quick recap of what the session today will look like, uh, we will start today with 10-minute uh, presentations from each of the panelists on which design options they and their institutions think are the best to improve our money system. We will then have a second round of contributions with questions from myself. And after that, we will open the floor to questions from the public for the last uh, 20, 15 minutes of the round table. We're running a bit of a delay, so, but I'm, I will ensure that you get your questions in there. Uh, a couple of housekeeping rules before I stop talking. Uh, we encourage participants to use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask questions throughout the presentations and the discussion with panelists. Uh, these will be addressed at the end, as I said, in the last 20 to 15 minutes. And there are also two things that you can do as participants to make my life as a moderator easily, easier. First, thanks to the democratic design features of Zoom, you can upvote a question in the QA that you like and think is important, which makes it easier for me to prioritize them. And second, it would also be helpful to specify to whom your question is addressed so that I don't need to guess it. Now, I've finally stopped speaking and hand it over to our first speaker for today, Evelyn. Evelyn, in this phase of the investigation of the ECB on the digital euro, which design features is it leaning towards in its effort to improve the money system? I give the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk on, uh, on the digital euro and where we are uh, uh, today. So let me do one step back. So uh, where, where, why are we doing it and where are we coming from? So as uh, I don't have to tell you, but we live in a time where almost every area of life is becoming digital and that's including the pay people's payment preferences. If we think about the digital euro, it would be a pan-European payment solution that should be accessible and functional throughout the entire euro area 
uh, which currently doesn't exist. So considering the decline of cash or the use of cash as a means of payment, uh, the digital euro would ensure that access to central bank money in the digital age uh, will continue to be there and will continue to provide a monetary anchor for the financial uh, system. Of course, cash will continue to be available, uh, but in order to ensure that our currency remains future-proof uh, and fit for purpose, we need also to adjust it to people's changing uh, payment preferences. A digital euro would be designed to make our lives easier when we pay, so it would offer users more freedom uh, of choice. They would be able to pay with a secure solution that fully respects their privacy because the central bank has no interest in people's uh, payment patterns. While the digital euro payments cannot be fully anonymous, we should strive for the highest possible privacy standards in line with Europe's ambition to be a standard setting when it comes to data protection. But it's up to the European legislators to strike the right balance between privacy on the one hand and traceability that we will uh, need to implement in the design of a digital euro. A digital euro will, of course, be designed to be inclusive and take on board people without access to a bank account and have low digital or financial skills, as well as people with disabilities. The digital euro uh, level of inclusivity will also depend on the legislative framework to be adopted by the European co-legislators, for example, when it comes to easy access to digital euro. The ECB proposes a digital euro that would support inclusiveness by being widely accessible throughout the euro area to ensure that the digital euro meets the expectations of consumers and merchants. It should be usable both via mobile app and physical payment card for those who don't own digital devices, free for basic use for citizens, as private as possible in line with the legislative uh, framework, available offline, anticipating situations of limited connectivity, and customizable, allowing users to define their preferred settings for account limits, for example, and automatic functions. Supervised intermediaries, banks, as well as non-banks, will play a key role in the distribution of a digital euro. In our regular exchanges with consumer organizations and merchants, they have remarked that the best way to ensure broad access uh, to consumers would be to require payment service providers to make the digital euro available to their customers. A digital euro will be free for basic use by private individuals. This is vital, we believe, for digital euro and resembles citizens' experiences with cash. Simultaneously, supervised intermediaries should be offered economic incentives to distribute uh, and encourage a digital euro uh, distribution, as they are currently doing for other electronic means of payments. In this regard, we believe that payment service providers would be able to charge merchants for their digital euro payments as determined by market forces. This pro principle would ensure that the fees for merchants cannot exceed and should uh, preferably be lower than the current levels for comparable means of payments. A wide digital euro distribution would allow for a more open and competitive uh, space, providing the platform for the private sector to develop further innovation in Europe. Overall, we believe that a digital euro would ensure Europe's monetary sovereignty and make our payment system more resilient, thereby supporting Europe's strategic autonomy by providing a European payment solution under European governance. We are currently approaching uh, the end already of the investigation phase of the project. We have recently published our third set of uh, foundational design options that was endorsed by the governing council, uh, which includes, for example, a distribution model via payment service providers and advanced functionalities. These findings will feed into the high level design of a digital euro that we will present shortly and which will also support the ECB's governing council when deciding on the future of the project, uh, which will take place in autumn. And with that, I will stop here and would be open at a later stage to answer any question you might have. Thank you. 
Thank you, Evelyn, uh, for giving us insights into where the ECB is at on the DiGiro and some of the design features that's leaning towards and what it's leaving to the EU legislators. So talking about EU legislators, let's move to Jan Kaysens. Jan, the Commission is set to come out with a proposal on the DiGiro towards the end of June. What are some of the things we can expect to see in that proposal in terms of design choices that will improve our money system? The floor is yours. Thanks very much um, also for organizing this uh, discussion today. Um, maybe before I start, I need a couple of uh, points on uh, also the role of the European Commission here. Indeed, I think uh, I think first of all, uh, we are really grateful that the ECB uh, uh, has done so much work on the digital euro to explore this uh, issue and uh, really this idea of making let's say public money fit for the digital age. Uh, I think. Uh, some people have asked, well, are, are the central banks not running far ahead? I, well, I think not at all. Uh, this is the way the digital age works. You, you can't just think, talk about things. You need to, you need to think them through. You need to try them, and you need to experiment. Uh, and only then you will really understand what the challenges are. And I think that's exactly what the ECB has been doing now for uh, for a long time already. Um, uh, from our side, we have uh, also early on started to kind of work together and uh, closely with the ECB to check a bit where what are a bit the regulatory. Uh, implications here and uh, and our role is really now uh, as you also uh, indeed uh, highlighted our role Vicky is really now to to uh, make a legislative proposal a proposal for a regulatory framework which then would be required and needed actually uh, if it's ever decided actually to issue the euro everything of course which is happening now are preparations uh, and uh, this is a big project so probably there will still remain preparations for a long time but if uh, at some point indeed it's decided yes we really need this and we want to put it in practice that can only happen once the legislator has actually uh, given, uh, uh, let's say, it's uh, not uh, and it's okay to that. And our role is here really now to uh, to prepare a proposal, which actually would technically be sound and which allow then the co-legislator and uh, Paul and his colleagues will, I think, uh, have already been very active and will even be more active on it, basically, would really then allow the legislator to, uh, let's say, to establish a digital euro, to decide on the yes or no, and to decide on, well, what's the basic direction of uh, of travel on this. So, uh, so much about our, our role here, in a way, really to uh, provide a bit of a proposal only for, for the regulatory framework and the key uh, and the key choices. Um, now, maybe coming a bit to the various points with the four points which you have um, put on the agenda or suggested for discussion today. Um, I think it's really important to start uh, uh, the, the discussion from, from what you want to achieve. And I think Evelyn has already ma made the different points uh, and, and mentioned them indeed. Uh, uh, why why do we, would we need a digital euro? Certainly not to tell people not to use cash anymore. So uh, people want and they should actually remain in charge on deciding if they want to live with cash only, if they want to have nothing to do with digital payments, that's the, the legitimate right of everybody actually to do that. Um, I think we do see, however, more and more people who actually who are going digital and we do see more and more, uh, let's say, modes of purchasing goods or interacting in the economy where you can't really pay with cash anymore. E-commerce, I think, is the, uh, is, uh, the, uh, the clearest, uh, clearest example. And so, let's say, from the citizen's perspective, it's really important for us that, uh, let's say, there is a, a possibility uh, to uh, also use uh, public money uh, in this uh, dig increasingly digitalized economy if citizens want to go there. So those, those who want to continue using cash, they should be able to do that. Uh, there's nothing wrong about it, basically. Those who actually are moving already in the digital age, uh, our generation, maybe the generation of uh, even uh, our kids uh, or their kids, basically, they should have also the choice, uh, as we have today, to use actually public money. Um, and that's, I think, important for, uh, for of course, let's say broader financial stability reasons, because this is really also public money is really the base of confidence and trust in, in ultimately our monetary and financial system. Um, it's important, and Evelyn, you mentioned both of them already, of, of course, also for Europe's open strategic uh, autonomy. Um, but it's really also important, I think, for, for the citizens and their daily life and the, uh, the way they proceed, they make payments and, and they use actually uh, uh, them. And the possibility also in the digital age, indeed, to, to know that you have a payment means which you can use really everywhere in Europe. Uh, like is the, to the, the case today with the, with the, with the euro uh, that uh, can work wherever you are, that everybody accepts basically uh, like indeed is the case of cash uh, today. 
Um, and I think all the items you put on the agenda for today really relate. Uh, one can really use it as a starting point, as a benchmark. It may be a bit, uh, let's say, of course, the situation on, on cash. And I think then the digital euro should aim to, let's say, uh, uh, let's say, have similar features. See what what are the the, the uh, added values, and maybe even go, uh, go beyond that. Huh? And let me go take them one by one. Uh, on inclusiveness, of course, let's say cash. You can everybody can take it in Europe. Everybody can access it. Actually, um, uh, you, you you don't need to uh, do formalities before, etc. Now uh, that's ideally also an objective for the digital euro. It's not as simple as that to receive a digital digital let's say uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, right or a digital value. You need to have a wallet or you need to have something digital to receive it. Basically, I as a citizen, as a physical person, I cannot receive a digital uh, let's say euro because I'm not a digital object basically so i mean you will you will need to have you will need to be in one way or another onboarded to the system to, to even that's in the nature of a digital system which uh, and is also different from cash for example and i think the objective here that needs to be uh, that this onboarding is as easy as possible as simple as possible uh, and that can work via uh, banks that can work via other channels you know for example we have this payment accounts directive in europe actually uh, where it's also a bit up to the member states depending on the local let's say situation to see indeed uh, what is the most appropriate way of people to actually get access to payment accounts and i think that's an interesting approach um, then i think the second point which you mentioned is indeed uh, uh, the fair cost for users again if i go today in the shop and i pay with cash i don't really have any uh, costs with that um, I think uh, uh, and uh, the objective uh, for the digital euro should be a very similar one. If you transact with the digital euro, you do the basic uses actually, which citizens do. Indeed, there should not be a particular actually cost uh, uh, tackled to it. Uh, of course, uh, none of no, nothing is free in life, basically. So uh, also for cash, somebody bears the costs. And I think then we need to see when you look at the side of the merchants, basically, we'll need to see that the framework overall makes sure that uh, people are not overcharged on this side, that the costs are fairly distributed. But for the end user, it should really be the basic users should really be free, I guess. Um, I think the third element you mentioned is the data protection. Again, uh, uh, the uh, cash is. Well, it is not anonymous. Uh, if if you want to get it from your bank or if you uh, want to put uh, back uh, money to the bank, uh, you will need to have an account, for example, and uh, uh, there will be some data traces. But it is rel relatively close to anonymity, um, and uh, we certainly uh, let's say think, and that again will be a difficult choice for the legislator. But it's very clear we don't want to go in a direction uh, as other jurisdictions are doing where maybe uh, cbdc uh, central bank digital currency can be seen as a uh, as a mechanism of uh, surveillance i think if europe uh, establishes a digital euro it should really be a mechanism and a symbol also of data protection as much as europe uh, with the gdpr has really taken the global lead indeed to to uh, establish a gold standard of uh, of data protection um, and in that sense, basically, I think there are quite a number of promising features which the digital euro can support. For example, uh, if there's the possibility also for offline use of the digital euro, indeed, uh, that is just one example where that also technical features can support then very high uh, private degrees of privacy. Um, the only uh, uh, point of caution I want to make here is that, of course, uh, privacy and data protection is not a one-way street in a way. We also know uh, the, the flip side of the coin is, is money laundering. And if you have a fully private financial system you can't combat money laundering so i think that's at some point is uh, let's say a balance which the legislator will have to uh, would like to strike um but uh, from our perspective it is important that on this uh, kind of uh, balance the data protection plays a very strong role and last of, but not least indeed the resilience uh well cash i think uh, uh unless you're in a fire basically you can really use it everywhere you don't need internet connection uh you you even in a conflict situation or in a natural natural disaster basically you can use it. that's what you refer to uh again i think uh, something digital is a bit different basically you need some digital kind of equipment to actually to transact with it but again the objective should be to uh, to make that as resilient as as possible um and uh, indeed let's say for example through uh, ways of offline payments or other other means other technologies actually to make sure that really the system is as resilient as possible I would want to add that indeed also the very fact of having actually a public, uh, let's say, system, a public uh, a digital money in the system, which indeed where the resilience and the system are guaranteed actually by the central bank itself, 
is also an additional uh, strengthens our resilience in an additional manner compared to relying indeed just on the systems which are established by a number of private uh, operators. So I think here again, uh, the digital euro can actually provide quite some, uh, if properly designed, quite some uh, some positive uh, features, which especially in today's situation will be quite uh, relevant. So those are just some remarks and re reflections on the four points which you which you made. Overall, however, what I want to stress again is that from the Commission side, I think we will not we are not, of course, uh, doing the detailed design, technical design of a digital euro. That is, I think, something which the ECB is in charge of. Um, and we, we will ultimately not take the policy choices either. We will make proposals, actually, and then it will be up to the to Paul Tang and his colleagues actually to uh, to decide where they want to uh, put the marker base. Thank you, Jan. And indeed, you you mentioned uh, cash as a baseline, and there will also be a, a parallel proposal on cash as legal tender coming out at the same time as a proposal on the digital euro. So that's also something to look out for uh, towards the end of June. So moving on uh, to Anna Martin, um, let's hear your insights from what consumers think are important for a successful digital euro and for them to use it. Handing over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Vicky. Uh, indeed, it's many topics which we which we just mentioned actually um, are the, really the, the added value or what we would see as the added value for, for consumers in a digital euro. So um, indeed, our starting point as for the previous speakers indeed um, is actually cash. Um, we look very closely on the on the developments of cash because um, that's for the time being still the the payment method which uh, works for everyone, which uh, everyone can use, um, but we see a strong development towards cashless societies. Um, of course, there are strong divergences uh, across countries, but um, when you look at countries uh, like uh, Norway or the Netherlands, where um, we are having moved already quite a lot towards a cashless society, um, there are increasing calls for, um, for getting back to, to cash or um, to have um, additional measures for financial inclusion. And I want to come back to, to actually two studies which have been uh, recently released. Um, one is from the Dutch National Bank and one is from um, the Norwegian Consumer Council, which is uh, one of BEOG member. And uh, these studies show that one in roughly one in six out of six adults has a problem with paying digitally. So we have um, a lot of people. It's 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 not just like uh, five percent or this kind of thing. It's it's really much more who have a problem to uh, only pay digitally when they go in public transport, when they use uh, essential services like healthcare, when they want to shop in their closest uh, small shops, uh, groceries, and all this. So so we really have a problem in terms of financial inclusion when and digital inclusion when we go to a cashless society. Um, and we need to solve this because otherwise these people are, are losing their independence in terms of really daily daily tasks they want to do. We almost pay daily for, for things uh, in, for essential services. So, so we really need a solution here. And that's for us really one of the key starting points for, for the digital euro where we believe that um, the digital euro must bring a public um, digital payment method which um, for, can pursue this public objective in other way that could pursue, could, uh, it could be pursued by, by private intermediaries, by, by commercial banks. Because um, in the end, um, if you have a public institution taking care of, of this payment method, um, you don't have this conflict of interest as you would have um, with an institution who is um, very keen on, on, on making a lot of benefit out, out of a payment method. So for us, really, the starting point is that we, we get something which is um, different than the business as usual digital payment method. And um, so, so we need a solution for financial inclusion. Um, what do I mean with financial inclusion? Um, I'm thinking here uh, on really a payment method which is easy to use, as easy as cash. Um, and for this, we need um, a strong role for still for um, human support. Um, so you won't get just because we go digital um, doesn't mean that we 
kick out all um, the services um, from bank branches, for example, which which helps you to to use the payment method. So we we still need human staff helping people to use the digital euro. You will still need ATMs where people can withdraw the digital euro um, to without having a digital device at home because you, you in the end you have still a lot of people who don't own a computer, who don't own the new smartphone, um, who don't have an internet subscription. So so that's really the point where we won't want to look at. And um, the second topic, which um, is key for us, is privacy. Um, cash allows you to pay, uh, to do transactions um, without being tracked and traced. Um, and when you're only moving to digital payment methods, your whole life is in your bank account statement. Um, you know which restaurant you are going to, you won't know where you're going to the supermarket, you know uh, eventually which political party you're paying. Uh, um, um, I mean, uh, um, a membership fee, I'm not talking of large, large donations, of course. Um, and what we really want to see is that for online and offline um, transactions of a low value, we get full privacy. Um, because we, we believe that otherwise we, we go into a, a society where you're completely, I mean, your data is theoretically available to to whomever you give access to, and um, that's that's quite a dangerous situation. Because I mean, when you look at also now the, the developments in terms of open finance, open banking, is that um, consumers are asked to give consent in many different occasions to their bank account state statements. So. part of the payment transactions of a lower value, um, which are not available and where the data is not available, so you're not even tempted to give it out. Um, that, that's the idea which we have. And um, then uh, perhaps last point, and it, it was already mentioned that we are really happy to hear that ECB and uh, Commission are aligned there is the fact that uh, we have a public payment method, which is easy to use, which is um, free of charge for consumers and which is accepted um, by all, um, I mean, like cash, like legal tender, because that's something which we don't have currently in Europe. You, When you go with a digital payment method, you are never sure when you go, for example, on holidays abroad, that actually your card is working there. We had have the issue with uh, some payment schemes which are uh, now be getting abundant. So, I mean, Maestro, for instance, is not working anymore at some point, and then you you, you cannot use your national card abroad. So these kind of things will be solved with the digital euro and that could be really an added value for consumers. So I think I will stop here and uh, let, letting some time also for the questions afterwards. Thank you, Anna. So this was the perspective of the, the consumers and I'm keen to get the perspective of uh, our member of parliament, Paul Tang, as a representative of, of all people. Um, what do you hope will come out of the legislative process for the digital euro later this year? Uh, thank you. And it's, it's great to have this discussion. Um, and in fact, I don't think the European Parliament has been already very active. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a first plenary debate. Um, and it was really interesting because it was the first time that I could see, and otherwise other people could see, what position members of European Parliament would take. And I must say that well, my first take on it was that there was a lot of skepticism uh, among the members of European Parliament. Maybe on second thought, uh, it is that members of European Parliament are now forced to make up their minds and start to work on it. That's why it's still many more questions than answers uh, from the contributions uh, uh, from the members of European Parliament. Um, and in that debate, you see different perspectives, I think, and also in, in, in this debate. I, I think one of the perspectives is that of a central bank and uh, the monetary anchor that uh, Evelyn uh, refers to. Uh, and I think that's important because, let's face it, the whole discussion on uh, CBDC didn't start with the fact that the cash is slowly but surely disappearing. No, it started all with Libra. So it was not 
disappearing cash. It was the appearing digital private money that forced us into this uh, into this discussion. And I understand, I fully under, uh, understand that the ECB and other central banks are worried by being taken over by foreign stable uh, stable coins. Right, uh, that would indeed. Um, disrupt the, the financial uh, system and, and monetary policy in that sense. Um, and even though the Libra has, uh, has, has project has died, it's still not unthinkable that it, will, uh, that it could come uh, in, a, in, a, in a form. And it's now interesting to see that we have this cooperation, this consortium of Apple and Goldman Sachs uh, we see another big tech company uh, venturing, in this case with, uh, of all banks, Goldman Sachs as a partner, venturing into, um, um, uh, in, in, uh, into payments. So, and I think that was at least accepted by part of the European Parliament. Personally, by me, yes, we need some, we need, if only as an option, we need to have a digital euro. To make sure that we are not, we not, we do not end up with a euro somewhere without without a euro, so to say. That is fine, but that is still um, uh, that is still sort of abstract uh, uh, macroeconomic consideration. Um, it becomes a bit more specific with a perspective that is missing from this discussion, and that is the perspectives of banks, because in, um, uh, before. When preparing the debate in the European Parliament, I looked at some of the position papers of uh, of banks, and well, they are pretty scared by the introduction of the digital euro. That's uh, and that's in a sense understandable. Uh, they fear that uh, the digital euro will um, uh, will be a good competitor for deposits, uh, which you like to you can hold your money in. To, uh, in the form of a digital euro, or you can hold your money at a bank account. These are alternatives. And they fear, uh, apparently, that introducing the digital euro will uh, diminish the possibility, uh, the, the capacity to finance through, uh, through bank deposits, uh, through, through savings accounts. And in fact, you can see the discussion uh, from the, uh, the, the, the communication from the ECB that ECB is um, willing to go far to indeed protect the private banks by introducing this holding limit of uh, 3,000 euro. It is could be more, could be less. I don't know. Let's see what uh, the ECB will propose. Um, and I will come back to that because introducing a holding limit, of course, has consequences for the use. But First of all, I'm not sure that the introduction of the digital euro is the real problem. I think there's already a problem developing for banks. You can see that very clearly in the US, where you see that uh, the, the small regional banks, Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic, um, see uh, the problem of a bank walk. Deposits disappear. and. I think that in a digital age, the mobility of um, uh, uh, of the of the savings accounts has increased enormously, and this put pressure on banks uh, on banks anyway. That is how I like to see it. So, but in all honesty, the digital euro can add to this trend of uh, of an unstable base from uh, from uh, from savings account and an unstable base for uh, for banking uh, for banking finance. So that's the second perspective, and that's not in this. Um, in, in a spell, I think it's relevant in the debate on the digital euro. But it brings me to the third, because I'm thinking, why would you choose? And this was, I think, the main question in the European Parliament. Why would one hold the digital euro? And it's not at obvious, by the way, to, of introducing a, a new currency, given that most people are financial illiterate and also digital illiterate. So, <laughs> so the question is, where to alternative for what in the first place? Is it the alternative for physical cash or is it the alternative for uh, private digital private money? But the main question in the parliament was, why do we want this as a user, as a consumer, as a voter? And the stupid thing is, in my initial answer would be, well, because it's very safe, right? That would be one of the thing. If there's no more safe money, then 
holding it in account with the ECB. But this is exactly what the ECB does not want to do because it introduces this holding limit. So the one absolute quality you have is sort of given away already from the start. And then you come back to all the uh, elements that were introduced uh, as part of this discussion. Is it fair? Uh, is, are the costs for users fair? Is it, uh, does it maintain privacy? Where well, I would like to think that the main advantage of a digital euro is it's safe for the user. And that's the reason why they want to use it. And I'm concerned also that uh, by putting the holding limits too low, in the introduction might be very difficult. Uh, and that from the start, um, and that this will be a non-starter from the start, so to say. This is one of the concerns. If we introduce, I have some sympathy for the idea that one that you introduce the digital euro and that you don't want to upset, especially with the ECB. You don't want to upset the financial system. I have some sympathy for that, but uh, then again, it should not be that uh, it should not re uh, diminish the desirability of holding the, uh, the digital uh, digital euro. Um, apart from that, I think another consideration in the debate, which I think is the important but not self-evident, can it contribute to access to financial services? Will it be inclusive? I don't think the digital euro is in itself a recipe for that. I think it requires an extra amount of effort. Like I said, already said, people are financial illiterate, people are digital illiterate. Introducing the digital euro won't be in a, a, a walk in the park from, a, from that perspective. But the good thing is, if you introduce a form of public money, there's a public institute behind it, and it will have, a, I hope, a very different approach of, uh, of trying to achieve inclusion. Because indeed, it's still the case that um, a surprisingly number of people don't, for example, don't have bank accounts. I was a bit shocked to see that, that in some parts of Europe, uh, there are still uh, a lot of unbanked. Uh, but I don't expect the private institutions to, uh, to take um, uh, financial act uh, to try to achieve the broad financial access. I rather trust a public institute to, to do that. Uh, so that is an opportunity, but I don't think it's self-evident that, um, uh, that the digital euro will be all-inclusive, so to say, will help, uh, will automatically lead to a broad access. I think it is just hard work to get uh, to, uh, to arrive at that. So I, I think I will conclude here, just trying to give you an impression from the debate from the European Parliament. I think they're also very much the different uh, perspective, and I think we should take them all into account. Uh, it's very clear that I don't not I don't think the digital euro should be here to protect the private banks. Far from it. I would rather see that we use this also as a way to uh, to raise competition uh, with the bank with the private banks. Uh, but also, I hope to see very much that the digital euro is in uh, is used. Uh, to broaden financial access and to uh, achieve financial inclusiveness. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul, for that very helpful overview of what the debate is like in the parliament at the moment. Um, very interesting to hear, and we'll touch on some of these tensions elements a bit later uh, in the discussion. So I'm going to, this leans very well into our next speaker, uh, Tristan, what is your take on where the DigiEuro currently stands and what is needed in order for it to be a true public good that benefits society and improves our money system? Yes, yeah, thank you, good afternoon. Um, I will share a few slides, um, mostly to, to reflect uh, on the main modality, which is uh, currently uh, uh, planned uh, for the digital euro by the ECB. Uh, as uh, Evelyn Whitlock explained, uh, the digital euro will, will mostly be an account uh, provided by uh, private intermediaries. Uh, and by private intermediaries, we mostly mean uh, banks. So I'll try to see uh, what we can expect uh, from this modality um, for the digital euro um, and uh, what critics uh, we, can we can make to it, uh, mostly to, to fuel uh, our debate. Um, so in terms of, uh, of access, uh, we can already note that if access is conditioned uh, by intermediaries, uh, users can be fenced off, which means uh, users can be prevented uh, from accessing digital euro services, depending on the terms, depending on the conditions 
uh, that will be set uh, by uh, intermediaries. We have to keep in mind that banks uh, and other financial institutions, uh, they are selective towards uh, their customer, customer base, meaning that they can refuse to take you as a customer, as a client, uh, if uh, they think that you are not interesting enough uh, from a, a, a financial uh, perspective. So if uh, onboarding for the digital EO uh, follows uh, the same procedures as for payment accounts, uh, as it is currently planned uh, by the project of the ECB, we can't expect uh, greater inclusion if we follow this modality because uh, digital EO accounts will not be more accessible uh, than bank accounts, which, uh, which they should be uh, actually. Uh, one of the solutions that is uh, considered is to have a mandatory provision uh, of the digital euro uh, by uh, payment service uh, providers. But even in that case, we can't expect to have uh, universal access. Uh, today, banks are legally uh, mandated uh, to offer uh, accounts to every uh, EU resident. But even despite uh, these legal requirements, we know that uh, they don't do so, and uh, part of the population still face uh, financial exclusion, uh, as, as uh, it has been said, and the digital euro uh, won't change uh, much uh, of that situation. Regarding costs, uh, it has been said already that the digital euro will be free uh, for users, uh, but again, if we rely on private intermediaries for the provision uh, of the digital euro, uh, they won't do it for free. Uh, private intermediaries uh, have to be profit making. So the provision of uh, digital euro services will have to uh, be conducive uh, with, with, uh, with their business model. Um, this could result uh, in uh, overall uh, uh, increased costs or uh, indirect costs for users. We can look at what incentives would have uh, private intermediaries to provide uh, digital EU uh, services to, to the people. The first would be a uh, compensation or remuneration coming from the ECB or the euro system. Well, in that case, uh, it will increase the overall costs uh, compared to a solution in which we don't have uh, a profit motive uh, for the distribution of the digital euro. Another solution for uh, private intermediaries would be to cross sell uh, their services. For example, in the case of the commercial banks, you would have access to free digital euro services only if you already pay uh, for a bank account, for example. That would be another solution imposing uh, indirect costs uh, for users. And the last one would be uh, what, what is called by the industry uh, value-added services, which would be developed by these intermediaries. But in that case, it, was, it would mostly rely uh, on mobilizing and using uh, users' data. Which brings me to, to the privacy aspect. Um, if uh, private intermediaries are involved uh, in the payment and in the distribution of the digital euro, well, of course, they will have access to, to personal transactional data. And as Anna said, uh, this data says a lot about, about us. Um, the digital euro will not change uh, anything on this front, and in, in, it will not uh, improve privacy uh, for, from this perspective. Uh, as uh, digital euro transactions will be transparent to uh, intermediaries, uh, which will be able to collect uh, this data and to monetize it um, at their will. Um, the ECB has repeated, repeatedly said that it has no interest in monetizing payment data, uh, which is uh, act actually true considering that it's a public institution, but at the same time, it does not offer users uh, with an alternative, which would be uh, more, more conducive to, to, to privacy. Uh, and, and as Jan said, uh, well, it could uh, set a, a higher standard for payments uh, if it would be offering uh, its own uh, payment solution as, uh, as we might see. Regarding uh, uh, resilience, finally, uh, the digital EU will, depend, uh, will be dependent on uh, existing payment trails. Uh, here, uh, we can take a broad look uh, at the payment system, which involves uh, different types of actors, banks, uh, card schemes, which are mostly Visa and MasterCard, but also acquirers uh, who provide acquiring services to, to merchants, 
the digital euro, which is currently being uh, discussed uh, at the ECB, uh, would be a digital euro scheme. Uh, and this digital euro scheme would, would only replace uh, card schemes, but it would still be dependent on other actors, other private actors uh, in the payment chain. Uh, it wouldn't provide an independent uh, and separate payment system, which could be used uh, as a fallback solution in, in, in the event of, uh, of extreme events and that other, other private payment systems uh, are down, uh, for example. So once we have uh, pointed to, to these potential limits, what, what, can, we, what can we consider uh, as, uh, as other solutions? Um, one of the main messages uh, of the report that we recently published uh, is that design choices uh, don't have to be mutually exclusive. We don't have to rely only on one uh, design choice. Um, I'm not going uh, into much detail here, but in the report, we uh, conceptualize four main models. Uh, the ECB chose one of them, but we can, we can find complementarities between models. Uh, a digital euro, for example, doesn't have to be provided only via uh, private intermediaries. It could be uh, uh, offered directly by the euro system. Uh, as well, a digital euro doesn't have to be only uh, an account, doesn't have to be linked to an account. Uh, it can be cash-like. Uh, it can have the same qualities uh, as cash uh, and to be transacted fully peer-to-peer -peer, uh, and uh, offline. So we, we really have to find complementarities between a uh, model. And what we call for in the report uh, is what we call a, a public option, which would be feasible uh, via the implication of public and non-for-profit intermediaries. Uh, it would broaden the scope of intermediaries with which uh, the public could uh, interact and access digital euro. We could have what we call an end-to-end -end solution, uh, for example, through an ECB app, uh, an app which would be developed directly by the ECB through which people could directly open an account without relying uh, on an intermediary. Uh, and we could also have Eurosystem smart cards, uh, which uh, answer to the point of Jan that uh, in order to have digital euro, you, you need a wallet. These, these smart cards could be used as wallets, which could be uh, fully anonymous and, and allow people to, to transact digital euro in a very universal way, uh, as well as offline, uh, which would bring uh, more resilience as well uh, if you can transact digital euro uh, fully uh, offline. So uh, this public option doesn't aim to uh, replace uh, the solution that is uh, proposed by the ECB, but to complement it, and the idea is really to complement uh, what we can expect the market to, to, to provide, because we can't expect the market to fulfill all needs, uh, and we can't expect the market to fulfill all policy objectives uh, that are linked with the digital euro. Thank you, Tristan, for uh, sharing insights from civil society. And I think this transitions us very well into our next round of contributions from the panelists, where we'll dig a bit deeper into some of the aspects that have been mentioned so far and that are causing some tensions uh, on the discussion about the digital euro. So uh, coming coming back to you, Evelyn, there, as Paul mentioned, and I and also Tristan, there seems to be a, a kind of trade-off between, on the one hand, ensuring that the digital euro is attractive enough for citizens to want to use it, and on the other hand, not making it so attractive that we step on the toes of the banking sector who are scared about deposit flights. Uh, as we've heard also from civil society, um, they think the trade-off is too much in favor of banks and there needs to be an option for people to access euros through a kind of public account that uh, Tristan set out. Can you give us some insights into how the ECB has tried to manage these, these two tensions there are these two seemingly conflicted, conflicting interests, and is a public option completely off the table? So that's a lot of things that you asked in one question. Uh, let me try to be uh, 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 as precise as possible. So um, we have indeed, uh, so we foresee that the digital euro is mainly a, a means of payment, um, um, where we agree with Paul that uh, in order to be an, uh, a good means of payment, which is easily accessible, it's important 
that the holding limit is not too low so that for every transaction you need to top up that would be really uh, a problem so we uh, agree that the holding limit should be uh, be such that it would also uh, still be a very good uh, user experience on the other hand we also need to make sure uh, as was said before uh, that uh, we have a stability in the financial system so we have done uh, some uh, calculations uh, on this and some modeling um, we have always said that uh, setting a potential holding limit, we will only do much closer to issuance. So, uh, but from our modeling with, with data from, uh, from, uh, from the current uh, stage, uh, we came uh, to uh, a model where 3,000 euros uh, would be uh, not a problem for the banks uh, or would not be a problem for financial stability, just also to be uh um sure that we take both and i think the financial stability of the banks is also a public interest for all of us uh, just to uh, to be uh, uh on that side uh, but we agree it, it there should be a sufficient room uh, uh to uh, to just use it as a convenient means of payment um how then to access the digital euro um indeed we have said uh, that uh, the the ecb cannot be the, the provider uh, uh, for the digital euro. Uh, so we need uh, uh, the distribution channel, which we think is the payment service providers. We think it's for the majority of people uh, also rather convenient. They are used to work with the banks uh, and, and they find that uh, the, the channel. Having said that, we find digital financial inclusion a very important topic. So we have been working also with the consumer organizations uh, on, on a deep dive uh, uh, on that. Um, and uh, a couple of things are already in our design. So, for example, uh, um, an offline uh, payment solution, which could be based on either secure element in, in your phone or on a, on a card. Um, we already have foreseen in our design that there would be a, a, a digital euro app, so independent from, uh, from your uh, uh, bank. If, if you want to have a further uh, public uh, approach that would not be on the euro system, uh, I would say uh, to decide uh, on itself. So that would be really also a discussion with the legislator, with the member states uh, uh, on, on, on how far they uh, want to go uh, uh, there. Thank you, Evelyn, for uh, your comprehensive uh, reply to my quite detailed question and long question. Um, I'm keen also to, to hear from Jan. I mean, Evelyn also mentioned the, the offline uh, possibility for having digital euro. And she also mentioned earlier that the kind of balance between traceability and privacy would be uh, something left to the EU legislators. I'm keen to hear your thoughts on, on just the balance between these two on the one hand, privacy and traceability, and also any thoughts on this idea of a public account, uh, if you have any to share. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think this is probably uh, if you want to pick one uh, of the choices, which is the most difficult one. I think the balance between privacy and uh, and uh, other matters is is a really uh, is a good candidate, basically. So I will not be able to give you today a final uh, thought from our side here, even because it's still something we're looking at. Um, I mean, I think uh, if we, I, I think we we need to strive towards a quite high level of uh, of privacy, and I think some of the technologies, and I think Evelyn mentioned indeed offline is something where basically indeed privacy is embedded in the design to a greater extent than some of the private payment solutions you have today, basically. Um, and I think secondly, we will need to have a regulatory framework which makes it really completely transparent where data can uh, flow, where it cannot flow, basically. Uh, so in a way, a digital euro is. We know in the digital world, in theory, we, we can design the systems all in a way that data can flow as we want it to, uh, to flow, basically. So I think it's really the legislator needs to really kind of uh, draw the boundaries here, basically what data can be looked at and what, what cannot. And that, that's also then for the trust in the system, very important that this is super transparent in the legislation, basically, what is, uh, uh, what is the situation. Um, I think that's what we uh, uh, what we can and have to uh, do in, in, in this uh, in this area. But where exactly, uh, let's say, the balance can can lie here, certainly, I think the the amounts. I think Anna, you referred to large and small amounts. That is a trade off which you always have. Huh? 
of course, the more the bigger the amounts, the more maybe also the risks for uh, money laundering and other matters. And then otherwise, secondly, I think the second element is indeed the technology offline, online. It makes a difference, basically, uh, uh, how, how the data can flow. Um, so I think those are just the considerations we are, we are looking at. But again, I think even our commissioners haven't really uh, kind of uh, come to a final conclusion on that. Um, secondly, maybe on the... Um, on the public, uh, let's say, role also in in uh, in the distribution of a digital euro. I mean, I, th I think just two points on this one. Um, I think uh, you've, uh, Tristan, you've made a number of important uh, points there. Basically, what the, my my first reaction would, however, be. Um, I think some of the, the challenges wouldn't go away if you if you do public distribution. I mean, even if you do public distribution, for example, onboarding in one way or another would have to happen i mean we can discuss the modalities and we can will have to discuss privacy but at some point somehow you need to get this card somehow you need to basically if you want to have larger amounts you need to somehow identify yourself uh, etc so i mean this this will have to happen uh, also if you do it let's say completely cash like peer to peer i mean uh, data can can if you want again that goes back to the previous point data can always flow i mean even and uh, i think paul has been working on this in the parliament uh, for example on the traceability of crypto assets that's today basically i think the highest level of kind of uh, nominality we have and actually i think the parliament is trying to track this down a bit basically but even there if you want to and that's what the parliament has been doing actually you can establish a system where indeed uh, large amounts are being tracked and traced so uh, it, it's not that if you go cash like that you go basically uh, uh, peer to peer uh, that you that you that you exclude the problems in a way. So those issues will always be there if it's public, if it's private, depending on uh, on the system you you uh, take. And so in that sense, it's really it's really then also a policy choice whether you think on the distribution side uh, what's uh, what's the right role of the private sector of the public sector. And I think there you you need to I mean balance a bit two things. Uh, I think on the one hand I think it's inclusiveness. And on the other hand, it's, uh, however, also, let's say, uh, uh, the acceptance and the adaptability for, for most of the citizens. And uh, let's face it, I mean, many citizens, they also want to have something which is comfortable. And uh, let's say the public solutions are not always the most comfortable. If we think back to an area where many banks were still public, actually, it wasn't particularly cheap. It wasn't particularly comfortable. So, I mean, uh, that's a bit a balance one needs to, uh, to take. So if you uh, kind of put all your eggs on the public sector, you, you may cater for, let's say, the excluded, but you may lose the large uh, kind of uh, a large bunch of the population. And, and that's where I think a bit the ECB is trying to, and I think that's broadly something we would uh, probably all support on our side, to find a find balance here, basically, to, to get on the one hand to, uh, to, to have acceptability and usability by uh, the large set of the population, and on the other hand, actually then devise specific solutions for those who are financially excluded. And what's, yeah, there can be a role for public uh, uh, bodies here, and we know this in some member states. The post offices, for example, I mean, they are in some member states, not in all, but they are really such an example of a public uh, a public institution. But it's maybe also something where then one would need to look a bit member state by member state what really the good solution in a way is, because it's not really the same uh, everywhere. Thanks a lot, Jan. Yes, I, th I think it's very important to also align all the conflicting interests of end users as well. There is obviously the concern about privacy, but then there's also the, the need for innovation and seamless transactions that a lot of, a lot of users want, right? Um, um, on the note of, of privacy, Paul, I'm particularly interested, and I also saw a, a question in the chat about there, there's been a significant public backlash against the DiGiro, uh, especially in the, in the Netherlands, there was a debate in the House of Representatives, and there was especially concern about privacy and state surveillance. And at the same time, there's been also a, a little bit of criticism about the, the technocratic nature of the process of the DiGiro so far. And so a question is, how can the members of European Parliament help ensure that there is a pluralistic debate and how can we get European citizens on board with the digital euro? Yeah, well, it's interesting to see that in the Netherlands, uh, there was uh, an, uh, much engagement in the public debates on, uh, on the digital euro. Uh, though you could also say it was largely captured by right-wing populists, in all honesty. Uh, so, and they emphasize very much privacy out of fear of uh, state surveillance, and then the example of China pops up. But it was true that it was one of the most attended debates in the, in the Dutch national parliament. Um, then again, it's, I, I emphasize it was captured by right-wing populists because they emphasize very much privacy, and I think most people value privacy, to be clear. 
But on the other hand, if you look at the Netherlands, it's one of the most cashless uh, economies in Europe, right? So, uh, and that means that everything is traced and tracked already in uh, uh, by private banks, and it doesn't seem to bother the average Dutch uh, person very much. So this is. Um, but generally, I would say that uh, we have um, good reasons to maintain uh, to maintain privacy. I think um, payment data are very sensitive, very revealing. Uh, I think we want to go towards a system where less and less sensitive personal data are available, and that includes payments. Uh, but of course, on the other hand, I'm also a rapporteur on the uh, the anti money laundering directive. Uh, it cannot be the case that once we have a suspicion that all data remains uh, remains private. On, on the contrary, we need to make sure that, it, that we don't give um, uh, a free pass to uh, to criminals or, uh, or terrorists to uh, to find. And so, this is where we strike have to strike the balance. But in fact, we usually do already. We already uh, encounter this balance because. When it comes to physical physical cash, or when it comes to uh, uh, bank transfers, this is where we already have this trade-off, and I don't think the digital euro, in that sense, um, poses a new challenge or a new trade-off. In a, it's part of the trade-off we already uh, we already make. Um, but it also depends on very much what mode in in what way the digital euro is introduced. Hearing this discussion and is that you need different ways to introduce the digital euro. One of the, the, one of the um, uh, ideas that I like and that Evelyn also put forward is the, the possibility of offline payments. It will be different if you have an offline payment system uh, when you have it uh, uh, through digital payments. But overall, I think uh, the, the trade-off is there, and, uh, but it's uh, sort of part of, uh, part, of, uh, part of usual business. Thank you, Paul. And actually going on with this uh, concern of uh, a privacy and offline means of payment, and I'm also curious uh, to hear a bit more about your thoughts in terms of the de design features that are needed to ensure that citizens kind of have this continued access to an anonymous means of payment, or at least something similar to a, a baseline privacy uh, that cash has uh, in the digital age today. Can you share some of the, the design features that you think are important for that? Was that for me? <laughs> I, I missed the name. Sorry, yes, to you, Anna. Yes. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yes. Um, so, yeah, but what do we need? Um, we need uh, for these offline transactions the possibility that we don't have the transaction data stored. Um, of course, then it, it depends. I mean, Evelyn mentioned that we, we, have the, we have the convenience aspect. Some people like it, especially for higher value transactions, you, you, you want to have the transaction data, you want to be sure that the payment went through, that's all fine. But we, we have lower value transactions where you want to have a higher privacy and there you should have the possibility that this transaction data is not stored, uh, meaning that it's not available for you, but it's also not available for anyone else, which is the more, more important part of it. Um, and that's something which we are currently, I think, at a, at a technical level, very much discussing um, how is that feasible. And um, it is feasible, but we need to be coherent uh, throughout the whole design that, um, that you can have that and uh, that you can have this possibility not to not store this data. And, and what, one important aspect there still perhaps is that, um, of course, it's important for us that, I mean, European uh, Euro system is not having the data, but even more importantly is that also the commercial banks, if there should there be the intermediaries, don't have access to this data because there we see more the, the, the conflict of interest of using this data for commercial purposes and where it becomes really important and that then if you get access for third party providers uh, via open banking, open finance, that there is no attempt to, to get access to these data. Thanks a lot. And yeah, Tristan also mentioned in his presentation, the use of smart cards, for instance, is this something that you've touched upon at all? Yes, I mean, we, we touched quite a lot on the, um, the card as a form factor. I mean, if you look, um, at the recent um, space study from the ECB, which looks into payment attitudes from um, users, you see that um, next to cash, 
especially for e-commerce payments, a card is really the majority form factor used, used for payments. So for us, it's really keen that consumers can stay with what they are used to uh, because payments is really also something where people like to, to keep their habits and don't want to change uh, every five years in a different way. Um, we see, for instance, that um, mobile um, payments are still really used by a min minority. I mean, that's all over the place when you discuss payments nowadays, but when you look really at what consumers are using on a daily basis, it's it's cash and cards. Um, so that we should also keep in mind that um, when we look into implementation, um, that we, we look on what people are actually using and not putting them something on on the spot which they they have to use and i think that that will not make the digital euro very su successful thank you anna and to sound there there's a kind of last topic that we haven't spoken too much about it's the resilience that you mentioned in in your presentation so how do you how do you see the euro increasing the digital euro increasing the resilience of the payment system in the case of outages or cybersecurity attacks and what are some of the issues that you see in the current design or the designs that are being leaned towards yeah so regarding resilience uh, the main the main factor to increase resilience uh, is uh, generally speaking diversity so if uh, the digital euro brings diversity into the payment uh, landscape uh, it would indeed increase uh, resilience of the payment system. And we see two ways uh, of, of doing that. Uh, the first uh, is to have um, a payment solution which is fully independent from existing ones, so which is not dependent on, on, the, on the private systems to be, to be up and working, to be able to, to, to work uh, for the digital euro. Uh, and the second one is about the, the offline uh, solution. If you are able to transact digital euro fully offline, uh, you are protected against um, a case where uh, internet coverage or uh, the electricity uh, supply uh, go down, uh, which, uh, which allow uh, uh, in, in the same way to, to have a backup solution, a fallback solution uh, to be able to, to pay uh, even, uh, even in, this, uh, in these situations. Um, and, and about, uh, about diversity and uh, to, to answer as well to, to Jan, uh, we, who, who called to not put all eggs in the same basket. Uh, we fully agree with that. And, uh, uh, but but when we look at the work done by the ECB, uh, it looks like all eggs, uh, all digital your eggs are, are put uh, in the same uh, private sector basket. And it's a, it's, a, it's a strong difference when you look at the work done by the, by the, uh, the, the Central Bank of Sweden, for example. Uh, the Riks Bank always consider private and public intermediaries from the very beginning of the of that project. It's something that we don't see uh, in the case uh, of the of the digital euro, and we we, we call for for diversity uh, to to find which complementarities can could be leveraged uh, between the the public and the private. Uh, and 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 again, we don't call for the public sector to to take uh, all uh, all tasks. Uh, but to provide its own solution in, in complement to, to what the market will uh, provide. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, I don't know if Jan or Evelyn want to uh, reply to, to Tristan's last remark. Um, and if not, we, we are well on time. So we, and I see there are a lot of questions in the chat. So I would suggest that we, we move on to the questions in the Q&A. Uh, unless there's anything, Evelyn Yen, that you would like to, to add following the interventions of the other panelists. No, I'll, uh, very briefly. So I, 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 I think, uh, so we agree on the, 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 that you need multiple solutions and that they will increase the resilience. Uh, that's also the reason why we say the digital euro will add and not, not replace or not cash, but also not necessarily a, a retail payment solution based on, say, commercial bank money. Um, on, on the reusability and, uh, of the system, we have on one hand the offline one, which really increases uh, the, the, uh, the resilience as well. 
uh, but also on the on the uh, infrastructure for the online we will uh, ha have a lot of separate rails so I, I but we would go too much into the detail but I, I think we will be more independent as Christian currently thinks so we might need to be clearer on that uh, going forward. Yeah, and maybe just to add, if I, if I may, indeed, I, I mean, my, my impression is at least, Tristan, uh, that uh, the ECB is, lo is, is looking as much as other central banks at all the different options, including also the public side, basically. Uh, I think that's also the case for us, basically. So I think I wanted to just reassure on that part as well. We have also been in touch with the Swedish colleagues, and I think Evelyn and colleagues as well. I, I have the impression that uh, this is, I mean, there's not, nothing excluded too early, basically, I have the impression. Thank you. And I actually there there is a final question from my side. I mean, especially uh, going through all the different positions and what has been said today, the DigiEuro is, is is quite technical. And as Paul pointed out, you know, it's people. <laughs> a lot of people are financially literate, also digitally literate. And as I mentioned before, there was a, a question the QA, which is very important. But how do, how do we get citizens on board and and clarify what's going on and what the benefits are? And I'm actually keen to to hear from all the. I think we all have a different role to play in this uh, civil society, uh, even the ECB, and of course members of parliament. Um, so an open question to to the panelists, uh, uh, whoever would like to answer. But how do we how do we get citizens uh, involved in this and get them to understand what it's about and yeah, hopefully get them to actually use the digital euro one day. Maybe I can go first, <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, others to add. So um, what what we considered in, in we are currently in the investigation phase is um, that it's very difficult difficult to go to the general public. So so I'm not talking about the direct stakeholders. Uh, um, so the banks and the consumer organizations and the merchants, uh, which we have involved from the beginning, but general public. Is very difficult if you don't have an idea how it's going to look like. So if you look to the beginning of the investigation phase, we had an, an concept of a digital euro, but not how it would look like. So um, we believe that more towards the end of the investigation phase, also when the, there's a draft legislation, when we have now done together with the direct stakeholders, so being the consumer organization, the merchants, the banks and the non-banks, we have jointly worked on all the designs, so we can be more precise. So uh, if we would explain why digital euro is important, really one of the first things that people ask, and how would it look like? So, um, and we, I, I, let me be clear, we cannot, uh, uh, we don't have a full design uh, with the uh, UX and whatever, but we can be more clear. So I think what you have seen already in, in the past half year is that in general, I think communication uh, has gone, gone up, uh, which is logic because also the draft legislation is coming and it's necessary, and, but we will be more and more in a better position to, uh, to explain. Uh, next to that, I would just want to say is that we find the communication very uh, important. So we have uh, set up from the beginning the interaction via the ERPB where every design decision has been discussed. Everybody was able to, to contribute. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Panetta, the board member from the executive board, goes to the European Parliament uh, roughly every two months to update, uh, to, uh, to, to keep everybody uh, uh, updated. We try to go to as many conferences uh, uh, like this and uh, seminars to uh, to answer questions uh, uh, and to present our, our views. Um, so, um, as said, um, I think we we are we already have done a lot of communication, but I agree with reaching the general public. Uh, there there needs to be more, which needs to be. Uh, an effort from all of us. Uh, so the ECB needs to take a role, the Parliament, the Commission, uh, but also consumer organization, merchant organization. I think we all have a role to make sure that people understand what's going to be discussed. I'll, I'll stop here and maybe others want to join or compliment. I mean, I think I think the uh, what what is important is that uh, we try to uh, facilitate as much as possible uh, uh, a well-informed and good debate on this. It is it is a significant step. So in a way, 
it is good that there is a debate and the debate means that there are pros and cons for the arguments. I think we just need to make sure that uh, let's say people have uh, uh, all the uh, information on the on the table. And I think maybe the first element, what is there important is basically the deal euro will not be imposed on anybody, basically. It's a choice, it's an additional choice, uh, but everybody uh, to decide whether they want to use it or not. Uh, and the second one is maybe, um, yeah, you can discuss what, what are going to be the benefits of the digital euro. You also need to think what, what will be the cost of non-digital euro, basically. So, I mean, uh, that will be a situation where then definitely uh, in the digital, we we're not going to move away from digitalization. I think that is a trend which, which is there. So basically, then it would really mean without a digital euro that what people have to realize that indeed all eggs are in the private basket, basically. And then, uh, well, we we don't know whether that private basket will be to uh, will be our local corporate banks tomorrow, whether it will be Apple Pay or whether it will be stable coins that nobody knows because we can't predict the future. But I think that's just what people, what one also in the discussion needs to, let's say, uh, think about what's what is the alternative, basically. And then I think uh, you need to have an open debate, I guess. Can I sort of, because be, I think there was one of the questions in the debate in European Parliament, why would people want to use it? And they're not going to use it because it's not imposed on them, right? Because they have, so what is the positive uh, reason to for choosing uh, the, the digital euro? That's that's the question. And I agree with Evelyn, it depends, of course, very much on what are the actual solutions uh, in practice. So what then you can then there's the time to explain. I still like to maintain that I think that it should be one of the safe options. That is one of the attractive elements. Uh, and I'd like to think also that it's not just an, it should not be an alternative for cash, but also for uh, for private commercial uh, options that are already out there. Uh, and I very much hope and I, I like to think that public institutions treat our data better than private institutions do, for example. So I can I can build a case. I'm not a marketeer after all, uh, but uh, I can think of some characteristics of the digital euro which could make it a very attractive option. But that's uh, and that should be part of also the political debate and then also of the, the public debate. Yeah, I believe, um, I mean, what, what is really important here is also, I mean, communication or general communication from institutions, organizations is one, one point clearly. And we, we want to have something which brings an added value and that will make communication easier. But I think there is another point, which is really this onboarding of individuals, um, people individually. And there we really need a strong network of human interaction. And I think Otherwise, we, we won't get it. I mean, people, when they start using a new payment method, and it's something which, see, which we see often with payments, that people are, especially moving digital, afraid of making mistakes, afraid of fraud, afraid of uh, something could go possibly wrong with their money. So we really need some, um, some system, some network of intermediaries, which are close to the people, um, helping them to get... Um, at first the digital euro account but also then to use it with the digital um with the different factors like how do i use this card how do i transfer this commercial money into central bank digital money i mean that's it's a whole new thing and um we shouldn't imagine that people will i mean of course some people will be tech savvy and will be quite uh, easily onboarded but others are not and uh, if that's our main target group, uh, we should really pay attention that that we get them all on board. Yes, and, and to to add on what was said, uh, maybe a first step uh, to for larger engagement on on the topic uh, could be more transparency uh, on the on the process itself. Uh, for example, uh, the work done um, in the market advisory group. Uh, could be more transparent. We have uh, only summaries of, the, of those exchanges, but uh, uh, more details uh, could be could be useful. The same as for the World Book Development Group. We don't have any material coming from uh, from, from this uh, from these uh, working groups. Um, and uh, such transparency would allow to really uh, evaluate uh, what options are on the, the table. I'm happy to hear. That they are all uh, on the table and that none uh, are excluded. Uh, but from what was uh, publicly published so far, uh, nothing allows to uh, guarantee and to see that, for example, public options are, are being considered. 
Um, and on the communication aspect, I think it, it's not only about explaining to, to people what it's about and uh, how it will be, but also engaging at early stage uh, with them. Uh, as part of my research, I've been uh, conducting design workshops uh, with, uh, with regular people. Uh, and uh, when, when you take the time to, to sit down with them, actually, they are quite receptive uh, to, the, to the concept uh, and they understand very quickly what's at stake. Uh, and they are able to um, to think about the ideal uh, means of payment and what uh, how it would how it would translate uh, for the design of the of the digital euro. So of course it's not something that the ECB can do uh, on its own. Uh, I think uh, national parliaments or even national central banks uh, would have a role to play in engaging with the public. We need really a broad network uh, to really engage uh, with, uh, uh, with the public and not only communicate with them in a, uh, uh, in a, in a dissident way. Sounds like we need a strong collaboration between all the partners and stakeholders in this panel today. Um, I'm going to start moving to the questions in, in the Q&A. Uh, there's a couple that are uh, the very, very popular, but I've seen a kind of clarification question that's maybe worth addressing first. Uh, so someone's asked, the majority of money in circulation in the U.S. currently money issued by banks as opposed to central bank money. How is the digital euro thought to be constructed? Will it be central bank money solely, like cash, and therefore replacing the current bank issued euro, or will it be added to that? It might be worth just clarifying the kind of status that the digital euro has in relation to cash and bank money. Uh, Evelyn, I see that you'd like to answer. Yeah, just to so indeed it will be like cash, uh, a liability uh, to the central bank. So uh, in that sense, it's it's the same in nature so the form is different uh, but uh, but its nature uh, will be uh, uh, the same uh, i forgot the second part of the question uh, i think it's and will it therefore be replacing the current bank issued euro so no, 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 no. So, so it will complement. So it will complement cash on one side. So it will not replace. It will complement cash, and on the other side, uh, you will still have uh, uh, the bank-owned uh, um, liquidity on base of which there are uh, what we call commercial bank uh, solutions, and they will uh, remain there as well. As uh, Jan has said a couple of times, the digital euro will be an additional choice uh, and not replacing uh, anything else. Thank you, Evelyn. I think this also answers the, the first question that was most popular. And maybe just going to the second question of financial uh, inclusion. So someone has asked, isn't the answer to legally oblige the acceptance of cash without additional fees? Instead of push people, we will never use the digital payment methods to do it. Uh, so I think this is about the, the acceptance of cash. Yes, Jan, I'll let you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's that's a very important uh, uh, part of the answer. So the answer is actually not the digital euro is not the answer to all problems, indeed, and also not the full answer to financial exclusion in a way. And maybe also this, I think, Anna, you mentioned also a couple of times that you need need to make the digital euro also kind of accessible to uh, people who are less literate uh, digitally. I, I fully agree. But I think I think we also need to be. I mean, for 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 some of them, uh, or maybe even a large part of them, it will also simply remain the case that actually good access to cash and preserving it is the better option, basically, to get them what they want, basically. So uh, uh, we just think it's not going to be. Neither of them is sufficient because we'll have we'll have these people who will not be very digitally literate, but we'll also have people who will be more and more uh, digitally savvy, and they will very soon they will not even consider anything which is not digital anymore. And uh, and in that sense, for them, we also need to have a digital option. So that's why we need both phases. But we agree, really, a strong, good uh, acceptance, mandatory acceptance of cash is is also indeed uh, part of the answer. And that's why also from the Commission side, I think, Vicky, you mentioned that, I think we will also come forward indeed with a package which has both, let's say, a legal basis for the digital euro and also indeed, uh, let's say, some clear rules on uh, the acceptance of cash, actually. Thank you, Jan. Anna? Yeah, perhaps to add on this, I mean, fu fully agree that it's it's complementary. We have some groups who won't, will never move to the digital euro. They are like, I mean, they, they pay with cash their whole life. We won't move them. That's, that's for sure. But we also have, I mean, the, the group who are currently excluded, if you look at these studies, which I mentioned in the beginning, 
uh, is very diverse. You have, for example, also people with disabilities who, um, due to the fact that uh, the EU Accessibility Act is not yet implemented, can simply not use all the ATMs which we have or uh, have really trouble with the commercial bank interfaces because they are constantly changing. Uh, there are small font sizes. You cannot switch on um, a listening um, mode where you can listen to the different things because there are so man many advertising in between, which makes the thing completely screwed. So these are the kind of things where we, we are thinking that you can create a public payment method, which is way more inclusive than that what we have currently with, with private payment methods. And um, also thinking that, I mean, we are moving more and more to a digital society if we want it or not. And you have some shops which are disappearing or which may, when you go, they, they simply refer you to, ah, but I don't have your size. You just need to buy it online. Or um, I mean, this, this is reality. Or if you go to public transport, um, I mean, go to Brussels. I mean, you can't use a tram or, or bus anymore and buy your ticket on the, on the bus and the tram. Um, if you if you don't have a payment card, so it's something also where we we need to accompany people to to be part of this digital society, because if they're completely kept out, they will be kept out of, of a lot of services from from our society, and that's that's a real problem. So it's it's a bit of everything. I mean that's that's the difficulty that we we cannot say okay we we go in one direction, we only take digital euro or we only take cash because it's it's so complex that we probably need both. Thank you, Anna. So there's there's quite a few questions about the kind of current uh, financial instability that we already see in the banking se sector today. And some some people are saying they're they're missing a bit of a conversation on this. And I guess this stems from you know a hope that a digital would solve some of these financial instability questions, uh, balanced obviously with also the financial instability that a digital euro could could cause for the banking sector. I don't know if it's if this is something that. Uh, some of the panelists would like to to speak about Paul. You you already mentioned it earlier today, um, but there's yeah there is a question about the role that digital euro can can play in increasing financial stability. Can I try one more time? Yeah, I think it it could have that role, right? Uh, what we see is that uh, bank deposits becoming more mobile, um, rather that we see bank wall uh, runs, we see bank walks, um, and that shows that. The current system in itself may not be stable. So look at, for example, the deposit guarantee in the US is higher than in the EU, $250,000, and still it doesn't prevent this type of bank, uh, bank walks. So topping up the deposit guarantee won't, won't help that. So it shows that we have, uh, we probably have a problem and it's all probably only becomes bigger in a more digitalized world, because that's one of the reasons why it's, we see this bank walks, it's easy to switch. All the more in an, uh, when the capital markets are more developed because money market funds are an alternative to uh, to bank accounts, and this is exactly what uh, what the EU wants the capital market union. Uh, so yeah, I think that that's already a tendency in that uh, in that direction, uh, and I think the digital euro can uh, can help to can accommodate in, in a sense that uh, that tendency and provide an alternative that is indeed uh, safe because. What you see, why do you have this bank wall? Because they, uh, the account holders are looking for safety, security, and it's not provided by the, by the private banks. Of course, it's not necessarily that we have, they have this discussion because of digital euro. I, I recently stumbled across the Chicago plan, which is, I think, from 1933 or something, which goes in, in, a sense, in that same direction, requires that... Uh, that bank accounts have a 100% coverage uh, capital reserve requirement. Uh, so in that sense, the discussion is not new. But then again, I think it's worth having this, this uh, worth having this discussion. And one of the great, um, um, uh, well, the great lure, the, 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 the one of the appealing ideas of the digital euro is that we now introduce again public money, whereas currently it's only private money. And that opens up uh, opportunities, if not uh, fantasies. Yes, go ahead, Ian. 
Yeah, and I'm not sure that the Commission and the, and the ECB very much like this way of thinking, but let's try on this one. That's, uh... I, I was just coming in. I mean, I, I think just one thing to put in perspective what's happening now in the US. Uh, I mean, we haven't seen our citizens in Europe, and I think, let's say, I mean, those who have more than 100,000 on their bank account, they're probably, I would say, not the majority, uh, certainly, probably rather the minority. I mean, none of our citizens has lost any of the deposits uh, uh, in uh, the protected by deposit insurance now, not even in the big financial uh, the financial crisis 2007 2008 basically. So I mean, the deposits in our private banks in Europe are safe. Let's I think that's very important to uh, to stress. Uh, and in that sense, I think from our side, we would like to keep these two discussions a bit separate in a way. I mean, there is a discussion now from this uh, the bank the, what's happening in the U.S. to see how you can actually how you can supervise banks better and what lessons do you need to, to take on this, to draw on this. But let's say from our perspective, uh, the digital euro will not necessarily be not, not will not be the answer to this. Um, and uh, it will not solve those problems. And I think in a way, to the extent, uh, let's say we also luckily in, in have in Europe quite good deposit insurance, but I think also overall uh, uh, strengthened our banking supervision quite a bit, uh, uh, have seen our banking supervision look precisely at all the risks which now have been actually uh, causing troubles in the US. Um, I mean, I, I think one can overall uh, reassure people that even without a digital euro, even today, really their savings in Europe, whether they are in a in cash under their mattress or whether they are in a in a private bank account, they are really uh, really safe. Basically. So that's probably luckily a problem we don't need to solve in Europe, I would think. But I mean, it's of course a discussion. So uh, I see indeed, Paul, as you say, we're probably not 100% on the same line. Yes, then. I'll head over to Martin. So I, I also heard this morning uh, on the uh, Belgian Financial Times that Europeans are not work, worried about banking instability. Still need to, to read this article in the report, <laughs> but Anna, go ahead. Yes, um, no, I mean, this financial stability has been a dis in the discussion all over the place. And I mean, I'm from a consumer perspective, not quite sure that actually people will um, empty all their bank accounts and, and put it to the digital euro account, because I mean, First of all, um, it's not meant as a saving account. So if we in the luck, in the future, hopefully get more interest rates on, on, on our saving accounts, uh, it shouldn't be very attractive to, to move all your money to the digital euro account. So that's the first thing. Uh, and second thing is also when you look at how people actually want to use these um, digital euro accounts, um, there has been this very recent study from, uh, from the ECB on, on digital wallets and testing, uh, how people want to use it. And one of the aspects, and of course, Evelyn can tell me you probably more on this, but uh, one of the aspects was that um, people want to use the digital euro accounts as sort of a prepaid, uh, similar to a prepaid card where you can top up money and you you have that as as if you top up like you put cash in your in your in your word, in your physical wallet. So it's something where you you are apart from your from your commercial bank account. You, you feel more safely to use it perhaps also digitally because you you you, you are not afraid to move accidentally um, 1000 euro instead of 100 euro because you you put a limited amount in this wallet so it's it's something where people really want to use it like cash and not like a saving account and I think that's that's really key in the financial stability debate and has been a bit overemphasized perhaps on, on the bank side, um, this aspect that people will all run with their money away from them, which uh, if there are attractive interest rates, I wouldn't believe that it's happening. Yes, and, and to add to what was said, uh, Paul mentioned the deposit guarantee. Uh, actually what happened uh, in the aftermath of the, of the SVB episode in the US, is that the Fed uh, guaranteed 100% uh, of, of deposits, so even above uh, the deposit guarantee limit. So today you have proposals in the US saying if the Fed guarantees 100% uh, of our deposits, what's the point of having uh, commercial bonds uh, uh, being, uh, in, 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 being the intermediate for our, for our money? We could have directly uh, accounts uh, at the Fed. So you have such proposals uh, that, uh, that exist. And which actually connects to, to a long debate about the division of banking activities between, on the one hand, uh, the activities linked to deposits and payments, and to the other end, uh, uh, regarding uh, investments and, and more riskier uh, practices. So there's really uh, definitely a, a connection if, we, if, you, if you think of the digital euro uh, in the long term, 
uh, it could be also a way uh, to discipline commercial banks, uh, even in, in the situation where people don't move all their funds uh, to digital euro accounts, uh, the existence of this uh, safe digital euro uh, would also be a way uh, for commercial banks uh, to be incentivized of being uh, less risky, more prudent, also more attractive uh, to, to consumers. Uh, and why not an occasion to, to lift uh, public guarantees on, on commercial bank deposits uh, if, if, you, if you have this safe uh, digital euro solution uh, available? Yeah, and perhaps uh, uh, just one one point to add because I think it's it's quite interesting this debate is um, the fact that um, as a bank I would be actually nowadays more afraid of um, big tech and what is happening there than the digital euro. I mean, you look at this um, Apple Goldman Sachs initiative, four percent interest rate um, on a on a saving account. That uh, sounds quite attractive. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not going in this direction, but I mean, it's it's if if I would be afraid of deposit outrun, then then these are these kind of initiatives where where it's probably more of a risk than than digital euro, where you, I mean, it's it's just the current account. It's not get, giving you anything. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there was there's also a question for uh, Evelyn. There's a question who said that the calculations of the ECB has shown that a holding limit of 3000 euros, according to the calculation of the ECB, are no problem for banks or financial stability. Has this study already been published? Yes, we we may. I, I, we in one of the speeches that Fabio Paletta made to the to the European Parliament, I don't know by heart and at what with what date. Uh, there was a reference to this study. I do it by heart. I think it was November, but I don't know exactly. And there was also a link uh, towards uh, the study that uh, that was done. So that this is available indeed. Thank you, and that's also something that we can find and, and send uh, with a with a thank you email after this um, after this panel. Um, sorry, I'm just going through all your questions. There's there's quite a few. Um, well, I think this one is more of a statement. Someone says oh, I would move all my money to Tajiro, but only if it's fully anonymous as cash. Um, Will the slides be presented, distributed? I see you're voting things up. Yeah. <laughs> will the slides be presented and distributed to the participants? Yes, uh, we will share everything. Uh, there is one that's been upvoted. Um, sorry, it just keeps shifting up. Cash is peer to peer, no intermediate, provides high autonomy. Will the digital have the, exactly the same features? I think this has already been discussed with some of the offline, offline. Um, offline version of the digital euro. Oh, here's one that hasn't been touched upon yet. Uh, why does the ECB understand the digital euro would never be programmable? Uh, aren't there potential benefits to be, to be gained for DVP of tokenized assets through programmability? And I think the ECB has quite a strong position on this. So Evelyn, I, I hand over to you. Yeah, I think it's an important point. Uh, earlier, it was referenced uh, the discussion in the Dutch Parliament, which was about privacy, was also very much concern about programmable money. And we need to make a difference between programmable money and programmable payments. Programmable money would be money where we would issue a digital a, a euro, and then we would say you can only spend it on something or only somewhere. So we put a limitation in the coin. And that means that if I would pay to Vicky, uh, this limitation will stay. So for example, I don't know, let's take an example, we put in the coin that uh, uh, it, you can only use it to buy shoes. And then I pay to Vicky and then Vicky can only buy, use it to buy shoes. So everybody that, that gets this coin can only buy uh, use it to buy shoes. That would be programmable money. This is not something the ECB is planning that we're going to do because it would be not issuing money. It would actually be uh, more like a voucher. So this programmable money is not uh, in the plans uh, of the ECB and in the digital euro. We did talk about programmable payments 
um, and that would mean that um, you could say, I want to do a payment, but there needs to be used a certain trigger, uh, and then this payment uh, uh, can be done. So we call it now uh, conditional payments also to, uh, um, to avoid uh, the confusion between programmable money and programmable payments. So these conditional payments. And there we do see that there is room for innovation. Also was confirmed by, uh, by the market that they see room for innovation. And that we have said we will make sure that uh, um, the digital euro uh, could connect to that. But the, the programmable feature or conditional payments, we will leave this to the market to develop these innovative uh, services on top of the digital euro. I hope I've been clear enough. Yes, thank you. thanks a lot. And there's also a, a question for Evelyn and Yanan. How will the digital be introduced in the financial system and how would the quantity of circulating digital be determined? Shall I go first? Uh, Jan has said a couple of things already. So um, the, the first thing that, that needs to happen so there's a lot of preparation. So this investigation phase is a, it, we do all kind of preparation to to think about the digital euro. If we would go to a next phase after uh, after autumn, uh, we would still be in a preparation phase because there first needs to be an adoption of the legislation before the ECB could consider to uh, to determine uh, or to decide to issue a digital euro. So I think that's important to understand. So, and then there will be, uh, so first we, we need to see an adoption of the legislation, assuming that at some point that there is a less legislation and it's adopted, then the ECB can decide to start issuing a digital euro. But of course, between saying, okay, we have the plan to issue a digital euro and the real issuance, there is time, even though we have done preparations, we probably need to have some time between us saying we have the intention to issue and then the real issuance of the digital euro. And then the digital euro will be issued. Um, and then uh, we need to see how, how the rollout will be done. That is still something that we are uh, looking into uh, uh, and forming first plans. So this could be done. Anything to add from that? I have nothing to add, I have to say. Um, there's also a question <laughs> again to Evelyn and Jan. Um, if the decision is made to proceed with the digital euro, regardless of which use case will be prioritized, is a simultaneous rollout across the eurozone expected? And if so, is any support foreseen for intermediaries to support to best achieve of this goal? Uh, I, I, I think uh, so the rollout indeed would be uh, following a decision. Well, I've already said that the, yeah. that will take some time and what would be the preconditions. Actually, how this would look like is still something we're working on. So um, we have been focusing more on the design. Uh, and then uh, the next focus would be more on how a potential rollout could be done and what could be timelines and how uh, what this would involve. Um, but yeah, it, it's a currency. So of course, uh, we have always said the digital euro when issued should, should be widely available and widely uh, accessible um, uh, in the eurozone. Um, so there might be some, I don't know, I, I, I'm not going to philosophize, but the idea is of course that it's roll out through the whole area in all euro area countries. Thank you, Evelyn. So um, unless there is something, Jan, you want to add, um, okay, I will suggest that we wrap up here before handing over to Wojciech for concluding remarks. Just want to say a big thanks to our speakers today and also our excellent audience. Thanks for helping me upvote questions. There were a lot of them there. I hope I got I covered most of them. Uh, it's been a real pleasure of moderating this event and we will be following up with a link to the recording, the slides and a copy of our position paper that will be out next week. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Wojciech. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. And uh, thanks to, to all for this uh, very rich event and for the discussion. For the, uh, I won't have a, a long summary, but my main takeaway would be that there has been a, I, what I heard was a kind of positive message in, in about this public option that Tristan, Tristan talked so much about, because, because what I heard both from Evelyn and Jan was 
in a way that, that, that at this stage none of the options were excluded so 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 this is uh, this is a very positive message. I we 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 are really waiting for 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 the outcome for, to see how how this digital euro will look like. I think that the point raised by Tristan about the diversity is a very important one. And and I mean, in a broader perspective, the ECB does a, an excellent job in you know fighting the fragmentation of the within the eurozone. But this is a part of it actually, and I think that the public option is a, should be seen. As a part of 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 of, of trying to uh, remain uh, to 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 remain to gain a more coherence in the eurozone, because the fragmentation is not only geographical; it's only it's always it's also social. It's also about inclusion, inclusion, exclusion. It's also about this new kind of money that uh, private money that uh, stable coins etc et etc so i think that there is a positive message to convey about uh, about you know the what the public option should be about and it's uh, even going to what jan said about uh, uh, the public options, monetary options, uh, being very cost, uh, very, 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 very uncomfortable for the user, etc. There was a strong point made by Anna Martin before, just before about about uh, what what does it actually mean for the users to 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 use all those devices, commercial devices today. I would I, I I'm I'm taking this away from this debate because it's a very important point that maybe it's very simple devices not changing every every month. And being widely used because they don't over they are not overloaded with you know with commercial commercial interest. Maybe this is actually value added, uh, some sort of you know uh, uh, slow, you know what do you say the digital slow digital evolution and not uh, because we are living in a in a in a in a world where this digital evolution uh, going faster and faster. But actually, the, there may there might be a case for slowness and and uh, simplicity. Uh, at least that is a, a point that I would uh, that I would stress. So I, as a, and I and I truly hope that this debate about the public option and uh, what comes out of it will continue. And the other point that was made, in, in which seems where we have not done sufficient work on the civil society side, is about the wider implications for financial stability and for the banking model uh, this was stressed by uh, both paul tang but also by others and this is i think a very vital point i think that the the fears are uh, exaggerated for the universal banking model as as we know it in europe is uh, quite exaggerated and uh, but uh, still we need to talk about it and and uh, you know in a, in a wider perspective it's we all know that it's not you know loans do not come from deposits but uh, deposits are being created by loans so uh, from that perspective we, we can always ask ourselves what have what banks have uh, and the financial system has done with this capacity to create deposits by loans so maybe maybe a, a, a sort of a, a situation where this deposit could actually migrate would be a, a very interesting option for uh, also from the standpoint uh, from of, of the financial stability but anyway this is this is something that we should uh, talk about uh, later uh, for i uh, not not only this year but also uh, the next year and in the succeeding years because this is these issues won't, won't uh, go away as uh, as we see the the financial uh, system is is uh, tra being transformed quite rapidly and we don't really know where we're heading so but for for the moment i think that we have put it much more insight into the four dimensions that we've been discussing and uh, and uh, so i only add to what vicky already said thank you for for your time and for your inputs and i hope that uh, we will also weblin institute will also send a, a message with a, with a link to the report uh, that i mentioned uh, in the beginning this is only a small contribution to to the debate, and I'm, I'm I hope that we'll continue to work uh, on this subject with uh, Positive Money Europe and with others, because there is a, a whole group of uh, civil society organizations and think tanks interested in these matters. So thank you once more, and uh, for for today, it's that's that would be all. Thank you also for 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 all the practical organizing work that has been done.
and uh, once more is sorry for the fact, um, practical problems uh, that we the technical problems we had in 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 to start the discussion for some panelists okay. thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much bye bye <laughs>